How was Rome sacked? After the split of the Roman Empire in 395, the West Roman Empire continued to weaken and Rome became subject to a series of brutal attacks by Germanic tribes. In 410 the Visigoths moved into Italy and looted Rome, in 455 the Vandals thoroughly ravaged the city. Finally, in 476 the city fell when the Germanic chieftain Odoacer 433-493, forced Romulus Augustulus, c450-, the last ruler of the empire, from the throne. By this time, however, Germanic chiefs had already begun claiming Roman lands and dividing them into several smaller kingdoms. The year 476 marks the official collapse of the West Roman Empire. What was the investiture struggle? Also called the investiture controversy. It is the name for the power struggle between kings and popes during the Middle Ages, 500-1350. Since the Papal States played the same role in medieval society as the other states, fiefs and manors, which were held by kings, their lords, who were members of the clergy, eventually became subject to the same human weaknesses that guided the feudal lords and kings namely, corruption and greed. Popes became powerful and worldly leaders. The struggle for supremacy peaked in 1075 when Pope Gregory VII, c. 1020-1085, who was trying to protect the Church from the influence of Europe's powerful leaders, issued a decree against lay investitures, meaning that no one except the Pope could name bishops or heads of monasteries. German King Henry IV, 1050 1106, who was engaged in a power struggle with Saxon nobles at the time, took exception to Gregory's decree and challenged it, asserting that the kings should have the right to name the bishops. This was an important point of disagreement. Since kings wanted to be in the favor of the Pope, and popes were selected from among the bishops. So, it was not purely a religious issue, political power was also at stake. Henry was excommunicated by the pope. Though he later sought and was granted forgiveness by Gregory, the struggle did not end there. Henry soon regained political support, deposed Gregory, in 1084, and set up an anti-pope, Clement III, who, in turn, crowned him Holy Roman Emperor. The debate over whose right it was to invest clergymen with the symbol of office continued through much of the Middle Ages. Who was the first woman to circumnavigate the globe? It was a young French woman named Jean Barrett. In 1766 Louis Antoine de Bougainville, 1729-1811, a French naval officer undertook an around-the-world expedition, 
which was successful and returned to France in 1769. But the crew made an interesting discovery en route. When the French arrived in Tahiti, the Tahitians immediately noticed something the crew had not that one of the servants on the expedition was a woman. Jean Barrett had been hired in France by one of the ship's officers. Kamer Khan, who also served as botanist for the expedition. Kamer Khan did not know Barrett was a woman. Her secret discovered by the Tahitians, she confessed. Revealing that she was an orphan who had first disguised herself as a boy to get employment as a valet. When she learned about Bougainville's expedition, she decided to continue the disguise in order to carry out an adventure that would have been impossible for a woman in that day. She was the first woman known to have circled the globe. Are the adventures of Marco Polo true? Most of the tales are accepted as true and accurate by modern scholars. It is only those accounts that deal with places where it is not known that Marco Polo traveled. Such as Africa, that are seen as legend rather than fact. Upon his return to Venice in 1295, Marco Polo, 1254-1324, took up the family occupation and worked as a merchant. Three years later, he was on board a ship that was captured by a rival Genos ship. He was subsequently imprisoned in the port city of Genoa, where he met a writer named Rustic Hello, or Rusticiano, from the Italian city of Pisa. Polo recounted his stories to Rustic Hello, who wrote them down and published them as the Divisament do Monde, Description of the World. The book was an immediate popular success and became one of the most important sources of Western knowledge of the East. Readers today know the stories as the travels of Marco Polo. What were the French holdings in the New World? The French possessions in North America, called New France, consisted of the colonies of Canada, Acadia, and Louisiana. The first land claims were made in 1534 by French explorer Jacques Cartier. 1491 to 1557, as he sailed the St. Lawrence River in eastern Canada. In 1604 Sieur de Mons, Pierre Duguay, c. 1568 c. 1630, established a settlement at Acadia. In present-day Nova Scotia, Canada, and French claims later extended the region to include what are today the province of New Brunswick and the eastern part of the state of Maine. After founding Quebec in 1608, explorer Samuel de Champlain, c. 1567-1635, penetrated the interior, present-day Ontario, as far as Georgian Bay on Lake Huron. Extending French land claims westward. In 1672 French-Canadian explorer Louis Joliet. 1645-1700, and French missionary Jacques Marquette, 1637-1675.
became the first Europeans to discover the upper part of the Mississippi River. Ten years later, French explorer Sieur de La Salle, 1643-1687, followed the Mississippi to the Gulf of Mexico. Claiming the River Valley for France and naming it Louisiana. While the French expanded their North American claims, the majority of French settlers lived in Canada. France lost Canada to Great Britain in the Seven Years' War, 1756-63. Louisiana changed hands numerous times before it was finally sold to the United States in 1803 as part of the Louisiana Purchase, it was France's last claim on the North American mainland. French culture and influence in these areas remains prevalent today. In 1635 the French also claimed the West Indies islands of Martinique and Guadeloupe. And its small surrounding islands, including Saint Barthélemy. In 1946 the French government changed the status of these islands from colonies to overseas departments. What are the elements of Japanese kabuki? The most popular traditional form of Japanese drama, kabuki features dance, song, mime, colorful costumes, heavy makeup, and lively, exaggerated movements to tell stories about historical events. The drama had its beginnings in 1575 when Okuni, a woman, founded a kabuki company. In 1603 at Kyoto women danced at the Kitani Shrine, playing men's roles as well as women's. In October 1629 kabuki became an all-male affair by order of the shogun Imitsu who decided that it was immoral for women to dance in public. Just as in Elizabethan England, women's roles were then performed by men. The performing art became increasingly popular during the 1600s, eclipsing Bunraku. Puppet theater, in which a narrator recites a story, which is acted by large, lifelike puppets. Today kabuki remains a viable art form, borrowing from other forms of drama to adapt to changing times. Who was Emmeline Pankhurst? Pankhurst, 1858-1928, a key figure in the women's suffrage movement. Was a militant reformer who waged a decades-long battle to win the vote for women in Great Britain. Pankhurst's sometimes radical campaign greatly influenced her American counterparts. Though she held various municipal offices and was married to an influential barrister. Richard Marsden Pankhurst she worked for change primarily through the organizations she founded. In 1889 she organized the Women's Franchise League. And five years later the group's work secured the right of all women, married and unmarried, to vote in local elections. She went on to found the Women's Social and Political Union in 1903. The Union was known for its extreme tactics. The British suffragist movement culminated in 1928 with the passage of the Representation of the People Act, which gave all women the right to vote in elections.
Pankhurst died later that year. Why did Schoenberg face sharp criticism in his day? The Vienna-born American composer Arnold Schoenberg, 1874-1951 Now considered one of the great masters of the 20th century was derided for having thrown out the rules of composition for working outside the confines of traditional harmony. In his youth, he was a fan of Wagner's compositions, seeing each of his major operas repeatedly. A series of Schoenberg's early works reflect the Wagnerian influence. But just after the turn of the century, Schoenberg set out on his own path. The result was the 1909 composition Three Pieces for Piano, which some music historians argue is the single most important composition of the 20th century. The work is atonal, which is to say it is organized without reference to key. Schoenberg abandoned the techniques of musical expression. As they had been understood for hundreds of years. This was no small moment for the music world, and many reacted with vocal and vehement criticism. Of the outcry, Schoenberg remarked in 1947 that it was as if I had fallen into an ocean of boiling water. But he had his followers, too, among them his students. Though he was essentially self-taught as a composer, he became one of the most influential teachers of his time. It's interesting to note, however, that his teaching approach was grounded in the traditional practices of tonal harmony. He later brought order to the chaos of atonalism by developing a 12-tone serialism. Showing how entire compositions could be organized around an ordained sequence of 12 notes. However, he never taught the method and rarely lectured or wrote about it. What was the Sino Japanese War? This dispute between China and Japan, who had not that long ago clashed in the Chinese-Japanese War of 1894-95, began in 1937 and was absorbed by World War II, 1939-45. The trouble between the Asian powers began when Japan having already taken Manchuria and the Jahal province from China, attacked China again. Though China was in the midst of internal conflict with the nationalist forces of Generalissimo Chiang Kai-shek, 1887-1975, fighting the communists under Mao Zedong, 1893-1976, China turned its attention to fighting the foreign aggressor. The fighting between the two countries continued into 1941 before war was officially declared by China. In so doing, China was at war not only with the Japanese, but with Japan's Axis allies Germany and Italy as well. The conflict then became part of World War II, which ended with the surrender of Japan to the Allies in September 1945. What caused the Bosnian War?
To understand the war in Bosnia, 1992-95, it is important to review the history of Yugoslavia. Treaties at the end of World War I, 1914-18, dissolved the Austria-Hungarian Empire. Creating separate nations of Austria and Hungary and dividing their former territory into three new countries. Czechoslovakia, Poland, and the Kingdom of Serbs, Croats, and Slovenes. The various factions within the Kingdom of Serbs, Croats, and Slovenes struggled for power. In 1929 King Alexander I, 1888-1934, an ethnic Serbian, dismissed the national parliament. Did away with the constitution, 1921, and declared an absolute monarchy. He also changed the country's name to Yugoslavia. The government was then dominated by ethnic Serbs, who had settled in the region as early as the 7th century AD and were converted to Eastern Christianity, Orthodox Christianity, by the 9th century. But the Serbian authority was challenged by the nation's ethnic Croats, whose ancestors had settled in the region by the 7th century AD and were converted to Western Christianity, Roman Catholicism, by the Franks. To try to end the struggle, in 1939 Croats were given limited autonomy within Yugoslavia. The arrangement was short-lived. Yugoslavia was invaded by the Axis powers in April 1941 in World War II, 1939-45. The war over, in 1946 Yugoslavia was divided into six federated republics. Bosnia and Herzegovina, Croatia, Macedonia, Montenegro, Serbia, and Slovenia. But the lines of demarcation between these republics paid little regard to the ethnic boundaries of Serbs. Croats, and Muslims, who have been in the region since 1526, when it was invaded by Turks. Federal power was in the hands of communist leader Josip Broz Tito, 1892-1980. At first Tito tied his government to the Soviet Union. He directed the nationalization of land, industry, utilities, and natural resources. But after 1948 he pursued a policy of non-alignment. In the 1980s Yugoslavia's economy weakened, exacerbating regional differences. Tensions among ethnic groups flared. In 1991, as communism fell across Eastern Europe, Yugoslavia began to break apart. By March 1992 four of its republics had declared independence. Croatia, Slovenia, Macedonia, and Bosnia and Herzegovina. What remained of Yugoslavia were Serbia and Montenegro. Serbs living in Bosnia and Herzegovina objected to the Declaration of Independence which had been approved by the Republic's Croats and Muslims. Fighting broke out in Bosnia. Cantered around the capital city of Sarajevo. Troops from Serbia entered the region to back the ethnic uprising in Bosnia. As with many civil wars, the conflict divided families and friends. Evidence mounted that the Serbs, under the direction of leader Rado von Karadzic, 1945, were engaged in a program of ethnic cleansing, including the mass murder of tens of thousands of Muslim refugees. In May 1995, 
after the Serbian military in Bosnia refused to comply with the United Nations UN, ultimatum. The North Atlantic Treaty Organization NATO, began a campaign of strategic air strikes on Serbian targets. The NATO assaults weakened the Serbs and brought them to the negotiating table in November 1995, when U.S. mediators helped broker a peace agreement in Dayton, Ohio. A single state, Bosnia and Herzegovina, was re-established. It was to be governed through a power-sharing arrangement among Serbs, Croats, and Muslims. But the conflict in Yugoslavia was not over. By 1998 the region's ethnic disputes erupted into another civil war, this time in the Kosovo province. In 2003 Yugoslavia was effectively dissolved with the establishment of the country of Serbia. And Montenegro through a peace accord brokered by officials from the European Union, EU. The new arrangement gave greater autonomy to each republic. What was the first animal sent into orbit? The Soviets immediately followed the success of Sputnik 1, launched October 4, 1957, by sending the first animal into space, a dog named Leica. The female Russian Samoyed traveled in a pressurized cabin aboard Sputnik 2, which was launched November 3, 1957. Making her the first living creature to go into orbit. The trip ended badly for Leica, however, she died a few days into the journey. Before sending humans into orbit. Both the Soviets and the Americans needed to prove that animals could survive in outer space. While the Soviets experimented with dogs traveling in space. By the end of 1958 the United States would send a monkey into space, but not into orbit. The following spring, May 28, 1959, two female monkeys, Abel and Baker, were launched into orbit in a U.S. spacecraft and were recovered alive. They had traveled 300 miles aboard Jupiter. How old is golf? Some historians trace golf back to a Roman game called Paganica. When they occupied Great Britain between roughly AD 43 until 410. Romans played the game in the streets, using a stick and a leather ball. But there are other possible predecessors as well, including an English game, called Kambuka. A Dutch game, Kalf, a French and Belgian game called, Chol, and a French game, Jeu de Mail. But the game as we know it, the rules, equipment, and 18 whole course. Certainly developed in Scotland, where it was played as early as the early 1400s. The rules of the game were also codified there. The Rules of Golf was published in 1754 by the St. Andrews Golfers, later called the Royal and Ancient Golf Club. The first golf club, formed 1744, was the Honourable Company of Edinburgh Golfers in Edinburgh, Scotland. 
and it was none other than Mary, Queen of Scots, 1542-1587. Who is credited with being both the first woman golfer and the originator of the term caddy? The term is derived from the French term for the royal pages, cadets, who carried the Queen's clubs. When did the major combat phase of Operation Iraqi Freedom end? President George W. Bush, 1946, declared an end to major combat on May 1, 2003. But the stabilization of Iraq was far from over. The fighting continued more than two years later, the result of an increasingly violent Iraqi insurgency. Faced with the ongoing resistance, in December 2004 the number of U.S. troops in the war-torn nation was increased from 130,000 to 150,000. Most of the casualties occurred after the declared end of major combat. On April 8, 2005, the Pentagon reported that there had been 1,543 American fatalities in the war to date 1,174 in hostile actions and 369 in non-hostile actions. Including accidents during routine maneuvers. Of the 1,543 U.S. military deaths, 1,404 died after the declared end of major combat, 1,065 of them from hostile action. More than 7,000 had been injured to date. In addition to the American fatalities, the British military had reported 86 deaths as of early April 2005, Italy. 21, Ukraine, 18, Poland, 17, Spain, 11, Bulgaria, 8, Slovakia, 3, Estonia, Thailand, and the Netherlands, 2 each, and Denmark, El Salvador, Hungary, Kazakhstan, and Latvia, 1 each. The figures fueled criticism for the lingering war. With some observers wondering if stabilization was possible in the fractious nation. There were several factors contributing to the growing lists of casualties and injuries. Coalition forces were frequently ambushed in attacks from resistance fighters and suicide bombers. U.S. troops faced continued combat in parts of Baghdad and its outskirts. The southern towns of Najaf and Kufa were holdouts of resistance, and there was intense fighting in the Sunni cities of Fallujah. Ramadi, and Samara, which remained under insurgent control even after the transfer of political authority from the United States to the interim Iraqi authority on June 28, 2004. Why is Rembrandt considered the archetype of the modern artist? To understand the similarities between Rembrandt van Rijn (1606–1669) and the modern artist, it's important to note that this master portrait painter, who broke ground in his use of light and shadow, was in his own time criticized for his work. Some thought it too personal or too eccentric. An Italian biographer asserted that Rembrandt's works were concerned with the ugly. 
and he described the artist as a tasteless painter. Rembrandt's subjects included lower class people, the events of everyday life and everyday business. As well as the humanity and humility of Christ, rather than the choirs, trumpets, and celestial triumph that were the subjects of other religious paintings at the time. His portraits reveal his interest in the effects of time on human features including his own. In summary, the Dutch artist approached his work with psychological insight and profound sympathy for the human affliction. He was also known to use the butt end of his brush to apply paint. Thus, he strayed outside the accepted limits of great art at the time. Art critics today recognize Rembrandt as not only one of the great portrait painters, but a master of realism. The Dutch painter, who also etched, drew, and made prints, is regarded as an example for the working artist. He showed that the subject is less important than what the artist does with his materials. Among his most acclaimed works are the Syndics of the Cloth Guild, 1662, and The Return of the Prodigal Son. C. 1665. The first painting shows a board of directors going over the books. And Rembrandt astutely captures the moment when the six businessmen are interrupted, thus showing a remarkably real everyday scene. The Return of the Prodigal Son is one of the most moving religious paintings of all time. Here Rembrandt has with great compassion rendered the reunion of father and son. Capturing that moment of mercy when the contrite son kneels before his forgiving father. Through his series of self-portraits, Rembrandt documented his own history from the confidence and optimism of his youth to the worn resignation of his declining years. Why are Thomas Paine's philosophies important to democratic thought? English political philosopher and author Thomas Paine, 1737-1809 Believed that a democracy is the only form of government that can guarantee natural rights. Paine arrived in the American colonies in 1774. Two years later he wrote Common Sense. A pamphlet that galvanized public support for the American Revolution, 1775-83, which was already underway. During the struggle for independence, Paine wrote and distributed a series of 16 papers. Called Crisis, Upholding the Rebels' Cause in Their Fight. Paine penned his words in the language of common speech, which helped his message reach a mass audience in America and elsewhere. He soon became known as an advocate of individual freedom. The fight for freedom was one that he waged in letters. In 1791 and 1792, Payne, now back in England, released The Rights of Man, in two parts, a work in which he defended the cause of the French Revolution. 1789 99, and appealed to the British people to overthrow their monarchy. For this, he was tried and convicted of treason in his homeland. Escaping to Paris, the philosopher became a member of the Revolutionary National Convention. But during the Reign of Terror, 
1793-94, of revolutionary leader Maximilien Robespierre. 1758-1794, Payne was imprisoned for being English. An American minister interceded on Payne's behalf, insisting that Payne was actually an American. Payne was released on this technicality. He remained in Paris until 1802, and then returned to the United States. Though he played an important role in the American Revolution by boosting the morale of the colonists. He nevertheless lived his final years as an outcast and in poverty. What was the temperance movement? Temperance was an American movement that began in the mid-1800s to outlaw the manufacture and consumption of alcoholic beverages, which were viewed by many to be a corrupt influence on American family life. By 1855 growing public support to ban liquor resulted in 31 states making it illegal to some degree. But a national policy of temperance was still sought by many. During the 1870s temperance became one of the cornerstones of the growing women's movement. As the nation's women, joined by other activists, mobilized to gain suffrage the right to vote, they also espoused sweeping cultural changes. In 1874 a group of women established the Women's Christian Temperance Union. WCTU, in 1895 the Anti-Saloon League was formed. Such societies, which grew out of a fundamentalist spirit found an increasing voice and eventually influenced legislators. Many of whom were dry candidates that the societies had supported, to take federal action. Even President Woodrow Wilson, 1856-1924, supported prohibition. As one of the domestic policies of his new freedom program. The movement met with success in January 16, 1919, when the 18th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution 1788 was ratified, forbidding people to make, sell, or transport intoxicating liquors in the United States and in all territories within its jurisdiction. Though Congress, which proposed the amendment on December 18, 1917, provided states with a period of seven years in which to ratify the amendment. It took just over a year for it to be approved, such was the prevailing spirit among lawmakers. After the amendment was made, Congress passed the Volstead Act to enforce it, but government nevertheless found prohibition difficult to enforce. Bootleggers, who made their own moonshine illegal spirits, often distilled at night. Rum runners, who imported liquor, principally from neighboring Canada and Mexico. And speakeasies, underground establishments that sold liquor to their clientele, proliferated. Soon organized crime ran the distribution of liquor in the country. Whose citizens had not lost their taste for alcoholic beverages. The government now found itself with a bigger problem. As the Federal Bureau of Investigation, FBI, and police worked to control and end mob violence. And as the country suffered through the early years of the Great Depression, 
lawmakers in Washington reconsidered. The Amendment On February 20, 1933, the U.S. Congress proposed that the 18th Amendment be repealed. Approved by the states in December of that year, the 21st Amendment declared the 18th Amendment null. And the manufacture, transportation, and consumption of alcoholic beverages was again legal in the United States, ending the 13-year period of prohibition. Herbert Hoover, 1874-1964, president at the time of repeal, called prohibition a noble experiment. How is Picasso's work characterized? It's impossible to characterize or classify the work of Spaniard Pablo Picasso, 1881-1973. Since his career as an artist spanned his entire life and he experimented with many disciplines. Picasso often claimed that he could draw before he could speak. And by all accounts he spent much of his childhood engaged in drawing. He was only 15 years old when he submitted his first works for exhibition. And by the turn of the century, when he was still a young man. He began exploring the blossoming modern art movement. The rest of his career breaks into several periods. His Blue Period, 1901-04, was named for the monochromatic use of the color for its subjects. And was likely the result of a despair brought on by the suicide of a friend. Next came his Rose Period, beginning 1905 when images of harlequins and jesters appear in his works all to a somewhat melancholic effect. He soon began to incorporate aspects of primitive art, and later experimented with geometric line and form in his works, which were constructions or deconstruct ions sometimes only identifiable by their title. In the spring of 1912 Cubism exploded, and Picasso was on its forefront. In 1923 he broke new ground with Surrealism. The key masterpiece in his body of works came in 1937 when he painted Guernica. His rendering of the horror of the German attack, supported by Spanish fascists, on the small Basque town, of Guernica, in Spain. His career reached its height during the 1940s, during which he lived in Nazi-occupied Paris. Biographer Pierre Cabain summed up the last period, 1944-73, of Picasso's work. He invented a second classicism. Autobiographical classicism. His final 30 years were to be a dizzying, breakneck race toward creation. During this time, Picasso did not chart any new artistic territory, but simply created art at an amazing rate. After his death in 1973, his estate yielded an inventory of 35,000 remaining works paintings. Drawings, sculptures, ceramics, prints, and woodcuts. He left an enormous even mind-boggling legacy to the art world. In a 1991 article in Vanity Fair, Picasso's friend and biographer John Richardson observed, Almost every artist of any interest who's worked in the last 50 years is indebted to Picasso, 
whether he's reacting against him knowingly or is unwittingly influenced by him. Picasso sowed the seeds whose fruits we are continuing to reap. When was the radio invented? The radio, or wireless, was born in 1895 when Italian physicist and inventor Guglielmo Marconi, 1874-1937, experimented with wireless telegraphy. The following year he transmitted telegraph signals, through the air, from Italy to England. By 1897 Marconi founded his own company, Marconi's Wireless Telegraph Company, LTD. In London, and began setting up communication lines across the English Channel to France. Which he accomplished in 1898. In 1900 Marconi established the American Marconi Company. He continued making improvements, including those that allowed for sending out signals on different wavelengths so that multiple messages could be transmitted at one time, without interfering with each other. The first transatlantic message, from Cornwall, England, to Newfoundland, Canada, was sent and received in 1901. At first radio technology was regarded as a novelty and few understood how it could work. But in January 1901 a Marconi wireless station at Southwell Fleet, Massachusetts, on Cape Cod, received Morse code messages as well as faint music and voices from Europe. That event changed the perception of radio, before long. Americans had become accustomed to receiving radiograms, messages transmitted via the wireless. In 1906 the first radio broadcast of voice and music was made, the event originated at Brant Rock, Massachusetts, on Christmas Eve and the program was picked up by ships within a radius of several hundred miles. That accomplishment resulted from the invention of another radio pioneer, American engineer Reginald Fessenden. 1866-1932, who patented a high-frequency alternator. 1901, capable of generating continuous waves rather than intermittent impulses, it was the first successful radio transmitter. In 1910 American inventor Lee DeForest, 1873-1961, the father of radio. Broadcast opera singer Enrico Caruso's, 1873-1921, tenor voice over the airwaves. In 1916 DeForest transmitted the first radio news broadcast. Westinghouse Station KDKA in Pittsburgh. Pennsylvania, was the first corporately sponsored station. And the first broadcast station licensed on a frequency outside amateur bands. Within three years of its first commercial radio broadcast. Which announced the election returns in the presidential race on November 2, 1920, Warren G. Harding won, there were more than 500 radio stations in the United States. What is Shinto? Shinto is the dominant religion of Japan. Its traditions call for the reverence of ancestors, prayer, and the observance of rituals. 
it is polytheistic, believing in many gods, Kami. Who are thought to be the forces behind nature as well as behind human conditions such as sickness, healing, and creativity. Followers of the Shinto religion believe these spirits are housed in shrines. Private shrines are erected in homes while public shrines can be highly elaborate. Including multiple buildings as well as gardens. The latter are the goals of many religious pilgrimages. Pilgrims pray and make offerings, of money and flowers, to the spirits. Originating in Japan in ancient times, Shinto has an interesting modern history. In 1882 religious organizations were divided into two group state shrines and sectarian shrines. State Shinto was controlled by the government. Which went so far as to proclaim divine origins for the Japanese emperor. After World War II, 1939-45, State Shinto crumbled and Emperor Hirohito. 1901-1989, was compelled to renounce his divinity. Sectarian Shinto religion still thrives in Japan today, where it has more than 3 million followers. What happened to Slobodan Milosevic? Like other Serb leaders involved in the recent Baltic Wars, former Yugoslav President Slobodan Milosevic 1941, faced charges of genocide, war crimes and crimes against humanity at the International Court Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, ICTY, in The Hague. He was arrested in Belgrade on April 1, 2001, and transferred to The Hague in June. There he faced 66 counts of war crimes from the Balkan conflicts. Before the ICTY, he pled innocent of three indictments against him. One for each major war crime scene, Kosovo, Croatia, and Bosnia. His trial began on February 12, 2002, and was marked by numerous idiosyncrasies. Including Milosevic's attempts to represent himself, without the benefit of counsel. His frequent refusals to cooperate with the court, and numerous days lost to his various illnesses. The prosecution wrapped up its case against him on February 25, 2004. After hearing testimony from almost 300 witnesses. The defense portion of the trial began on August 31, 2004 and was slated to last 150 court days. Not the same as calendar days. As of June 2005 the trial was still underway in The Hague. When did the Industrial Revolution begin? The Industrial Revolution began in Great Britain during the 1700s. And by the early 1800s it had spread to Western Europe and the United States. It was brought about by the introduction of steam power driven machinery to manufacturing. By the close of the 1800s most finished goods, which had once been made by hand or by simple machines, 
were produced in quantity by technologically advanced machinery. Why did General MacArthur vow to return? Two weeks after the Japanese bombing of the U. As military bases at Pearl Harbor and the Philippines, Japan invaded the Philippine Islands. General Douglas MacArthur, 1880-1964 The commander of the U.S. Army forces in the Far East, led the defense of the archipelago. He had begun to organize his troops around Manila Bay when, in March 1942, he received orders from the president to leave the islands. When he reached Australia, MacArthur said, I shall return, in reference to the Philippines. Under new commands, MacArthur directed the Allied forces. Offensive against Japan throughout the Southwest Pacific Islands. After a string of successes, on October 20, 1944, MacArthur made good on his promise. Landing on the Philippine island of Leyte, accompanied by a great invasion force. By July of the following year, the general had established practical control of the Philippines. When Japan surrendered in August, MacArthur was made the supreme commander of the Allies, and as such, he presided over the Japanese surrender aboard the USS Missouri on September 2. He received the Medal of Honor for his defense of the Philippines. But he wasn't the only hero in the MacArthur family, his father. Arthur MacArthur, 1845-1912, had received the nation's highest military award during the Civil War, 1861-65. When did modern architecture begin? The term modern architecture is used to refer to the architecture that turned away from past historical designs in favor of designs that are expressive of their own time. As such, it had its beginnings in the late 19th century when architects began reacting to the eclecticism that was prevalent at the time. Two schools emerged, Art Nouveau and the Chicago School. Art Nouveau, which had begun about 1890, held sway in Europe for some 20 years and was evident not only in architecture and interiors, but in furniture, jewelry, typography, sculpture, painting, and other fine and applied arts. Its proponents included Belgian architects Victor Horta, 1861-1947, and Henry van de Velde, 1863-1957, and Spaniard Antonio Gaudi, 1852-1926. But it was the Chicago School that, in the rebuilding days after the Great Chicago Fire, 1871, created an entirely new form. American engineer and architect William L. E. Baron Jenny, 1832-1907, led the way. Four of the five younger architects who followed him had at one time worked in Jenny's office. Louis Henry Sullivan, 1856-1924, Martin Roche, 1855-1927. to 
William Holabird, 1854-1923, and Daniel Hudson Burnham, 1846-1912. Burnham was joined by another architect, John Wellborn Root, 1850-1891. Together these men established solid principles for the design of modern buildings and skyscrapers where form followed function. Ornament was used sparingly, and the architects fully utilized iron, steel, and glass. By the 1920s modern architecture had taken firm hold, and in the mid-20th century it was Furthered by the works of Walter Adolf Gropius, 1883-1969, L.E. Corbusier, Charles Edouard Ginaret, 1887-1965, Ludwig Mies van der Rohe, 1886-1969, and Frank Lloyd Wright, 1867-1959. For practical purposes. Modern architecture ended in the 1960s with the deaths of the aforementioned masters. Examples of modern architecture include Chicago's Monadnock Building, 1891, Reliance Building, 1895. Carson Peary Scott Store, 1904, and Roby House, 1909, New York City's Rockefeller Center, 1940. Lever House, 1952, and C. Graham Building, 1958, as well as Taliesin West, 1938-59, in Arizona. Johnson Wax Company's Research Tower, 1949, in Wisconsin, and the Laval House, 1929, in Los Angeles. Why is Aristotle considered one of the greatest minds in Western history? The system of philosophy that Aristotle, 384-322 b. c. developed became the foundation for European philosophy, theology, science, and literature. The Aristotelian system may be so much a part of the fabric of Western culture that the only effective way to describe his philosophy is through example. Among his writings on logic is organon, meaning tool or instrument. Here he defines the fundamental rules for making an argument. While other thinkers may well have formulated the argument before Aristotle, no one had made a systematic study of it. In Organon, Aristotle puts forth a method for coming to a conclusion based on circumstantial evidence and prior conclusions rather than on the basis of direct observation. This deductive scheme, called a syllogism, is made up of a major premise, a minor premise, and a conclusion. For example, every virtue is laudable, major premise, courage is a virtue. Minor premise, therefore courage is laudable, conclusion. It is worth noting, however, that the belief in deductive logic was later rejected by English philosopher Sir Francis Bacon 1561-1626 in 1620, in favor of an inductive system, or one that is based on observation. In Poetics, Aristotle expounded upon his literary views. He maintained that epic and tragedy portray human beings as nobler than they truly are. 
while comedy portrays them as less noble than they are. In order to explain how tragedy speaks to the emotions of the spectator, Aristotle introduced the idea of catharsis. He separated tragedy from epic with the distinction that tragedy maintains unity of plot. Later translated as unity of plot, time, and place, while the epic does not. Because of the keen understanding evident in poetics. The work has illuminated literary criticism since antiquity. In addition to logic and rhetoric, Aristotle wrote on natural science, physics. On the heavens, parts of animals, and on plants, and on ethics and politics, politics. His great philosophical work was metaphysics, so named because, in the body of his works. It comes after, the Greek word for which is meta, the work physics. Metaphysics as a philosophy is the study of substance, or the nature and structure of reality. It is considered one of five major branches of Western philosophy. In modern thought, metaphysics can include many disciplines, such as cosmology. The study of the origins and structure of the universe, and theology, the study of religion. Most of the great philosopher's writings are compilations of notes from lectures he delivered to his students at the Lyceum, also called the Peripatetic School, in Athens. Among his pupils there were Greek leaders, including Alexander the Great, 356-323 BC. What is empiricism? Empiricism is the philosophical concept that experience, which is based on observation and experimentation, is the source of knowledge. According to empiricism, the information that a person gathers with his or her senses is the information that should be used to make decisions, without regard to reason or to either religious or political authority. The philosophy gained credibility with the rise of experimental science in the 18th and 19th centuries. And it continues to be the outlook of many scientists today. Empiricists have included English philosopher John Locke, 1632-1704, who asserted that there is no such thing as innate ideas that the mind is born blank and all knowledge is derived from human experience. Irish clergyman George Berkeley, 1685-1753, who believed that nothing exists except through the perception of the individual, and that it is the mind of God that makes possible the apparent existence of material objects, and Scottish philosopher David Hume, 1711-1776, who evolved the doctrine of empiricism to the extreme of skepticism that human knowledge is restricted to the experience of ideas and impressions, and therefore cannot be verified as true. What is the Kyoto Protocol? It is an environmental agreement signed by 141 nations that agree to work to slow global warming by limiting emissions. Cutting them by 5.2% by 2012. 
each nation has its own target to meet. The protocol was drawn up December 11, 1997, in the ancient capital of Kyoto, Japan. And went into effect on February 16, 2005. The United States is not among the signatories. American officials said the agreement is flawed because large developing countries including India and China were not immediately required to meet specific targets for reduction. Upon the protocol's enactment, Japan's Prime Minister called on non-signatory nations to rethink their participation. Saying that there was a need for a common framework to stop global warming. Environmentalists echoed his call to action. Why is the Renaissance considered a time of rebirth? The term Renaissance is from the French word for rebirth, and the period from a D1350 to 1600 in Europe was marked by the resurrection of classical Greek and Roman ideals. The flourishing of art, literature, and philosophy, and the beginning of modern science. Italians in particular believed themselves to be the true heirs to Roman achievement. For this reason, it was natural that the Renaissance began in Italy. Where the ruins of ancient civilization provided a constant reminder of their classical past. And where subsequent artistic movements, such as Gothic, had never taken firm hold. When was the New York Stock Exchange founded? The oldest and largest stock exchange in the United States, the New York Stock Exchange. NYSE, had its origins on May 17, 1792, when local brokers who had been buying and selling securities under a designated tree agreed to formalize their business transactions. The NYSE that most people would recognize today opened for business in 1825 at 11 Wall Street, New York City. At the time most shares traded were in canal, turnpike, mining, and gaslight companies. Though a few industrial securities were first traded on the New York Stock Exchange as early as 1831. It was another 40 years before the complexion of trading changed to a more industrial nature. As the nation became increasingly manufacturing oriented. The companies listed on the exchange reflected the economic shift. Today, if corporations wish to list their stocks on the NYSE, they must have a minimum of 2,000 shareholders, each of those original shareholders must have 100 or more shares. The corporation must be able to issue at least 1 million shares of stock. And it must also provide a record of earnings for the previous three-year period. The board of the stock exchange can make exceptions to these guidelines. Corporations may be listed with other stock exchanges, such as the American Stock Exchange. Or they may allow stock in their company to be traded as unlisted stocks. Which are bought and sold in over-the-counter, OTC, trading. Companies that do not allow shares to be publicly traded are called private corporations.
What was the Norman Conquest? The Norman Conquest is the brief but critical period in British history that began when the French Duke William of Normandy, c. 1028-1087, sailed across the English Channel in 1066 and invaded England. This was upon the death of what would turn out to be England's last Anglo-Saxon king. Edward the Confessor, c. 1003-1066, while William became known as William the Conqueror. And he did conduct a brutal conquest of Anglo-Saxon England, he might have had reason to believe. He could claim the English throne upon King Edward's death, the named successor, Harold, c. 1022-1066, of the powerful Wessex family, had two years earlier become shipwrecked off the coast of France. Where he reportedly took an oath that he would, upon King Edward's death, support William of Normandy, who was King Edward's distant cousin, as heir. Hearing of Edward's death, William and his army set sail for England where Harold had already assumed the throne as King Harold II. But Harold had previously quarreled with his brother Tostig. And the noble Wessex family was divided and engaged in a power struggle. Tostig was joined in his fight by the Norwegians who, at the same time that William was landing on England's southern coast, invaded from the north. Thus, William and his troops entered England without opposition. Since Harold was focusing his efforts elsewhere, though the king defeated the Norwegians and Tostig, who was slain in battle, he would not emerge the victor in his subsequent battle with William. On October 14 the two met in battle at Hastings, near the entrance to the Strait of Dover. Though he fought valiantly, Harold was killed. William was crowned at Westminster Abbey on Christmas Day 1066. Within a few years. By 1070, he had killed many Anglo-Saxon nobles and the rest he deprived of their land. In the 21 years of his reign, William imposed Norman aristocracy on England. Required that French be spoken at court, and drew England closer to Europe. He ruled until his death in 1087. After which the Norman nobility mixed with what was left of the Anglo-Saxons. It is this intermingling that produced the English language from the German tongue of the Anglo-Saxons combined with the Norman French. William's descendants, albeit distantly so, have ruled England ever since his takeover in 1066. Is Virgil's Aeneid an unfinished work? Yes, the Aeneid was technically unfinished by its author, Virgil, 70-19b. C, who is considered the greatest Roman poet. Virgil spent the last ten years of his life working on the Aeneid. And he planned to devote three more years making revisions to this epic when During his travels to gather new material for the poem, he became ill with fever and died. On his deathbed, 
Virgil requested that his companions burn the Aeneid. However, Augustus, 63b.ca.d14. The Emperor of Rome, countermanded the request, asking Virgil's friends to edit the manuscript. Augustus did specify that the writers not add, delete, or alter the text significantly. The Aeneid, Virgil's great epic about the role of Rome in world history, was first published in 17 BC. The work consists of 12 books, each between 700 and 1,000 lines long. How did America get its name? America is derived from the name of Italian navigator Amerigo Vespucci, 1454-1512, who took part in several early voyages to the New World. Vespucci had been a merchant in service of the Medici family in Florence, and later moved to Spain where he worked for the company that outfitted the ships for Christopher Columbus's, 1451 to 1506, second and third voyages. He sailed with the Spaniards on several expeditions, in 1497, 1499, 1501, and 1503. Though scholars today question his role as an explorer, in a work by German geographer Martin Wald Seemuller. C1470 C1520, published in 1507, the author credited Vespucci with realizing that he had actually arrived in a new world not in the Far East as other explorers, including Columbus, had believed. Thus, Wald Seemuller suggested the new lands be named America after Amerigo Vespucci. For his part, Wald Seemuller was led to believe this by Vespucci himself who had written to Lorenzo de' Medici in 1502 or 1503, relaying his discovery of a new continent and vividly describing it. About a year later, the letter was published under the title Mundus Novus. New World, which was translated and published in future editions. The designation America was used again in 1538 by Flemish cartographer Gerardus Mercator. Gerhard Kremer, 1512-1594 Today the term in the singular refers to either continent in the Western Hemisphere and sometimes specifically to the United States. In the plural, it refers to all of the lands of the Western Hemisphere, including North and South America and the West Indies. <laughs> 